this episode of Misset, it was a double feature. It's the same day, hence the back-to-back -back episode. I don't think I've done any of these yet, but I'm a little behind schedule, so I figured it'd be good to just do one and then do another one. So double feature. Tonight's episode, remember we just focused on the MV Joyita. Well, this episode is going to be on Paula Jean Weldon. Who was she? What happened to her? That's what here. That's what we're here to find out. So, without any further ado, mystery unsolved: the disappearance of Paula Jean Weldon. I would like to know. I'm going to do my best to make sure this doesn't time out. I don't know why it's live, so it shouldn't do that. But I don't know. Hopefully, it doesn't. All right. So, who is Paula Jean Weldon? Let's find out. Paula Jean Weldon was born on October 19, 1928. She disappeared on December 1st, 1946, which means she was 18 years old when she disappeared. She was an American college student who disappeared while walking on Vermont's Long Trail hiking route. Local sheriffs were criticized for errors made in the investigation, which led to the creation of the Vermont State Police. I'll circle back to this in a minute. Weldon's fate remains unsolved and was one of the most several unexplained disappearances in the same area at the time. Okay. Local sheriffs were criticized for errors made in the investigation. Does that sound familiar? Remember a couple months ago? Remember like the consistent amount of episodes that I did and every single time in competent police officers? Well, looks like we're about to get that. But at least this one tells me beforehand. So I don't have to judge for myself and draw the conclusion. They're telling me. All right. We need to know who she was. She's a college student. That's all we really got about, right? After finishing her shift in the Bennington College dining hall, Weldon returned to her home and changed into walking clothes. The fuck are walking clothes? <laughs> what? the hell are walking clothes? I've never heard of that. Her clothing was adequate for the weather that afternoon, but not for the anticipated drop in temperature that night. Okay. I can hear the tablet. Make The tablet's making some weird noise. I don't know. Hopefully it'll be all right. She packed no bag, took no extra clothing, and did not take any extra money. From all appearances, she did not expect to be gone for more than a few hours. Weldon walked down the campus driveway and had hitched a ride from State Route 67A near the college entrance to a point on State Route 9 near the Furnace Bridge between Bennington and Wood Woodford Hollow. Well, she hitched a ride. What year was this? This was 1946. Okay. Now, nobody hitchhikes anymore. Back in the day, that was a source of transportation. People hitched a ride. I don't like that sound. I really don't. Local contractor Lewis Knapp picked Weldon up and drove her as far as his house on Route 9 about 2.5 miles from the long trail. From this point, Weldon either hitchhiked or walked the rest. Come on. From this point, Weldon either hitchhiked or walked the rest of the way to the start of the trail and looked for power. A group of hikers were walking down the trail as Weldon was walking up. She approached them and asked them a few questions about the long trail. How do we know all this? That these people? Weldon continued walking in a northerly direction what the hell was he? Oh, yeah. on the road portion of the trail, now known as Harbor Road. She was on the trail late in the afternoon and darkness was falling as she approached the end of the Harbor Road. She may have continued into a quickly darkening woods. It was presumed that she must have continued her walk along Bulls Brook Valley, although there are no known confirmed sightings of her past. 
of settings that could pass the faithful camp. All right, there's a bunch of locations. Basically, this is a college girl who decided going for a walk one day. Apparently, she did that. A couple people saw her, hence the reason we know that she was at these locations. Weldon did not return to campus. Her roommate thought she may have gone to the library to study for exams. But the next morning, Weldon still had not returned. Once the college administrators were notified, they immediately started the search of the campus itself. The Bennington County State's Attorney was notified, and the county sheriff was brought in to help with the search. Over the next couple days, Weldon's visit to the Long Trail was discovered when one of the hikers she had approached identified her from the photo in the Bennington Family newspaper where he marked out to everyone. Weeks of searching ensued. Bennington College closed for several days, and students and faculty participated in organized searches. Hundreds of volunteers, family members, National Guard troops, and firefighters searched for welding to no avail. Ground and air searches concentrated on the long trail as far up as Glattenberry Mountain, 10 miles to the north. The trail's various branches and along the Route 9 from Bennington to Brattleboro. Mm. Most of those searches assumed Weldon had gotten lost in the woods. When no clues were found as to her whereabouts, other theories started to be considered. So basically, in a nutshell, a college girl decides to go for a hike, a little walk, in the afternoon. She's out there so long that it gets dark. A couple people see her on the trail. She goes and listen the next day. Her roommate doesn't know where she is. They do an investigation. They're, in, they're actually able to contact and get in touch with some of the people that actually last saw her. And nobody knows where she is or where she went. The manner in which Wolverine's disappearance was handled by local law enforcement was sharply criticized by her father and many others. Wolverine's father pointed out that the lack of a statewide law enforcement organization and the lack of training of local sheriffs contributed to a poorly run investigation. Within several months of Rowan's disappearance, the Vermont legislature created the Vermont State Police. Can you imagine that? The state sheriffs did such a shitty job that the state was like, you know what? We're going to create the Vermont State Police. We're going to create a police force for the state because the sheriffs here are so incompetent. Oh yeah, look at that. It does it does time out. That's weird. I'll have to look into that. But yeah. The sheriffs did such a shitty job that the state of Vermont was like, you know what? We're gonna have to create a state police force. Kudos to her dad. It's like you guys suck, you know? Alright. Alternative theories have speculated that Weldon had been in unusually high spirits and had decided to run away to start a new life, was going to meet a secret lover and eloped with him, or had become injured and suffered from amnesia. Darker theories speculated that Weldon was depressed and may have died by suicide, whether she had been kidnapped or murdered. Okay. Remember I said that police were incompetent? I wonder if that was one of the police's theories. Like, oh, well, you know, we could look for your daughter, but in all seriousness, so she's, she probably just went into the woods and committed suicide. Because that's what naturally every single police officer says in previous videos. All right. There's a little bit more to read, and then I will address these theories. At the time of Weldon's disappearance, there was no state police organization in Vermont. We just we just saw that, we, obviously. And the state's attorney, Cornish. The county sheriff and state investigator Almo Franzoni was responsible for finding clues. Bolden's father pressed the investigators and Governor Mortimer R. Proctor <laughs> Mortimer, to bring in additional professional law enforcement help. Proctor asked the governor to lend assistance. Connecticut State Police Detective Robert Rundle and State Policewoman Dorothy Scoville, I like these names, at least I can pronounce these, were assigned to the case. The interview, 
They interviewed every person who saw or they thought saw Weldon and every person who lived along the route she took or who were simply in the vicinity of the long trail on the December afternoon. Investigators discovered that one of the last people to see Weldon alive was a lumberjack named Fred Gad Gadlet? Gadette, sorry, who, who lived along Harbor Road. The debt in the midst of an argument with his girlfriend when Weldon walked by. He stormed off in a jealous rage shortly thereafter, and depending on different statements he made, went to his shack and spent the evening by himself, where he drove up the travel portion of the trail, where Weldon was heading. He lied to police on several occasions as what and was a person of interest, both in 1946 and when the case was revisited in 1952. Hmm. A mysterious lumberjack. Reportedly, Gadette told at least two people that he knew within a hundred feet where Weldon was buried. But later claimed it was just idle talk, with no evidence when no evidence was found that a crime had been committed, no body was discovered, and no friends or clues were identified. This avenue of the investigation ended. Ah, yeah, that's not suspicious at all. Okay, we got a couple theories here. We'll save the best for last, i.e. the last thing I just read. Okay. She decided to run away to start a new life. By all accounts, it is worth noting she had been in unusually high spirits. Does that mean she was happy? Did anybody say she was off? Did she normally go for walks? These are questions I probably should know, but we don't have that information. If she was happy-go-lucky, she was in a good mood, if she normally went for walks, then okay. This is just a crazy thing out of the blue that happened. But... But we don't know if she ever went for walks a lot. Apparently she didn't. So did she run away to start a new life? I, I don't have much here to draw to that conclusion. And I don't know her personally, obviously. I didn't know her personally. I was not alive. Nor were many of us. But I can probably tell you that running away to start a new life is always the go-to. It's like, well, we don't have much, so maybe they started a new life. What evidence do you have to support that? I'm not liking this one. Was going to meet a secret lover and eloped with him. Or her. Ah. Secret lover? Hmm. I was going to sing the song, but I decided not to. Um... I don't hate this one, but what happened to her? Like, did they decide to run away together? Like, this is this one's too happy. Like, not only did she run away, but she had a, she met a secret lover, a local, and they both ran off into the sunset. Eh. Or had become injured and suffered from amnesia. Okay, but if she got injured, suffered amnesia, she'd still be in the woods. Somebody in town would have found her, brought her back. I don't know. Where, where did this take place again? Oh, yeah, Vermont. Vermont's rather small. The town she's in must have been rather small. If she got amnesia, surely somebody would have brought her back to her family or somebody that knew her. They would have gotten to her family. I don't know. I don't like that one either. Darker theory speculated that Weldon was depressed and may have died by suicide. Well, happy-go-lucky or I'm going to off myself. He didn't find a body, so it's not a suicide. Or had been kidnapped or murdered. Well, unless the person that wrote this article worded this wrong, I like the lumberjack theory. I don't get it. Like, he got into an argument with his wife, storms off, sees this beautiful young woman, college student, maybe tries something with her. 
She tries to fight back. He kills her. Hence, he's the only person that knows where her body's buried, which I will get. Yeah, let's go back to that part. The dead told at least the two people. Now, let's remember, they don't know where she is. They don't know if she's alive or if she's dead. They don't know whether it's she, that. They do not know whether or not she is alive or dead. We don't know. So here comes Fred Gadet. Had an argument with his wife. Saw this gorgeous young college student walk by him. Him and his wife get into an argument. He walks the same way in a rage that Paula is walking. Paula Jean Weldon. Reportedly, Gadet, Gadet told at least two people that he knew within 100 feet where Weldon was buried, but later claimed it was just idle talk. That, sir, is not idle talk. No, one's, no one mentioned about a body being buried. Nobody mentioned about anybody dying. Nobody mentioned about Paula Jean Weldon being buried or having been killed or died. So that is a very loaded answer. When no evidence was found that a crime had been committed and no body was discovered and no forensic clues were identified, the avenue of the investigation ended. You know what I think it sounds like? Small little town, Vermont, all a bunch of incompetent sheriffs who know Fred Gadet, the dumbass lumberjack, covered for him. He murdered Paula Jean Weldon. They knew he murdered her. The father, Paula's father, was probably like, they're incompetent. They're not doing their job. The Vermont State Police was made, not because of the incompetence of the police officers, but the lack of willing to prosecute Fred Gadet, the lumberjack, because they knew him and they were in cahoots over it. Boom, look at that. I just created a total crazy conspiracy theory. Look at that. I might have just solved the freaking murder. I feel good. <laughs> what do you think happened? Do you like my theory? I love my theory. I think Fred Gadant, the lumberjack, murdered her. And the sheriffs, while incompetent, knew him personally and decided not to even look into it. So like, oh, well, you know, you just like to blow off steam sometimes, Fred. It's all good. Do you think she ran off with a secret lover? Do you think she offed herself? Do you think she was kidnapped? Do you think she ran off into the sunset by herself to start a new life? What do you think happened? I'm pretty sure I solved it. <laughs> I like my theory. Fred the dead, the crazy lumberjack, in a fit of rage over his girlfriend and him fighting, killed her after she decided to go against his, his advances. All right. In literature because there's some stuff I've written about her. Author Shirley Jackson was possibly inspired by Weldon's vanishing when she wrote her novel, Hangisman, as indicated by Jackson's papers in the Library of Congress. At the time of Weldon's disappearance in 1946, Jackson was living in North Bennington where her husband was employed at Bennington College. Oh. Jackson's short story, The Missing Girl, included in Just an Ordinary Day, the 1966 collection, 1996 collection of her previously unpublished, uncollected short stories, also references the Weldon case. So she was really inspired by it because her husband, Shirley Jackson's husband, actually lived at the college. I mean, he, he worked at the college, and also they lived in the same state. So author Hilary Waugh's novel, Last Seen Wearing... Oh, that's what it's called, last seen wearing. I thought there was more to it than that. About the police investigation into the disappearance of co-ed Marilyn Lowell Mitchell from Parker College in Bristol, Massachusetts, is generally acknowledged to have been inspired by, if not directly based on, Weldon's disappearance. Three different names, incompetent police. Yeah, it definitely is. All right, well, that was a fun little case. I, I do say so. Just under 20 minutes here, we are now at 20 minutes, and 
yeah, this was a really clean cut case, if I do say so myself. I think I solved the damn murder. I don't think there's any mystery behind it. I think the whole flake, obviously there's a not a lot, there's not a hell of a lot to go on, but the one freaking person that looks insanely guilty is most likely the, the guilty body here. So to Mr. Fred the Debt, shame on you, sir. Actually, pretty much shame on the state troopers of Vermont, hence the reason the state police was created. This has been Mystery Unsolved, the disappearance of Paula Jean Weldon. I do hope you enjoyed this episode as well as the disappearance of the MV Joyita. And that you enjoyed this double feature, which I don't rarely do, but I might start doing on occasion. To just get through them or, you know, to build interest. Do stay tuned next week. Yes, I should be coming back next week. I barely think so. Or maybe not. I don't know. Do stay tuned for the next episode, whenever that might be, of Mystery Unsolved, where the topic will be on the disappearance at Lake Michigan. What happened there? Tune in to find out next time. For Mystery Unsolved, I am Justin Bienvenu. Until next time.